Tetra Talk Radio. You're in to all things music. I do a lot of breathing exercises with students. You know, before you even open your mouth to, to sing a note, there's got to be a sense of effortless breathing. You know, effortless is the key word here, I think. You know, mm-hmm. it's got to be second nature. It's got, and you'd be surprised how often we forget to breathe when we're standing there singing or in just everyday life. You know, that's the fuel, for heaven's sake. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to the show, and thanks for tuning in. I want to let you know how much I appreciate you joining us on our show. If you missed last week's interview, you can hear it and all of our episodes at entertalkradio.com slash making it or download our app and take us with you. So often I get questions about the creative process. So I created this show to focus on what it takes to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business. You're really in for a treat as I've invited my friends, some of the best and brightest in music, to share their stories on how they have influenced the music that has shaped our lives. I guarantee you're going to love it. So let's get started. My guest today is Grammy Award winning vocalist Cheryl Benteen. Born in a small rural town, Mount Vernon, Washington, Cheryl was born swinging. Her father was a band leader, and to this day, she attributes her deep-seated roots in classic jazz and swing to singing with, singing with him on Saturday nights from age 14 through high school, all while Cheryl's mother drove her to piano lessons. What seems as natural as breathing out and breathing in was at that time paving the way for her life. In 1979, Cheryl joined Manhattan Transfer and dove headfirst into rehearsals as well as the studio to record her first album with them. This collaboration with her new singing partners has garnered 10 Grammys to date. You can hear Cheryl on Manhattan Transfer's brand new album, The Junction, as well as on her latest solo album, Rearrangements of Shadows. Please welcome my guest today, Cheryl Benteen. Hi, Cheryl. Hey. Hi, Terry. How are you? I'm great. And it's it's such a pleasure to reconnect with you. It's been a long time since we've uh, gotten to see each other and, and talk. And I know. And, uh, I know. and I feel like um like I'm in the room with you. I know you're you're calling in from your two hundred year old home in, in the Boston area. Yes. And, uh, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's it's that's a whole story the right there. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. It it doesn't stop. I've got a big tarp on one of my windows right now with some leakage after a big storm we had like two nights ago. So, and now we're waiting for snow again. Yeah. Fantastic. So do you have to, (laughs) can you get some help before then or, or do you just uh, tough it out and not stay in that room? You know, I just, Oh no, I'm in the room right now. It's just, you know, I tough it out and I, I'm kind of a, a one woman handy person here. I've, I've learned to do pretty much everything here on my own, except electrical wiring. <laughs> well, that's something I you don't want to really mess around with. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think just like in life, um, it's important to know your strengths and your weaknesses, <laughs> you know, and perfectly and, uh, put. Yeah. That, that's a beautiful segue actually. Yeah. But, yeah. I, I know what I can sing. I know what I shouldn't sing. I know what right. I I love to sing and I have musical, you know, favorites. And sometimes those don't work for my voice. You know, if you want to really dive right into that area, sometimes, sure. you know, I, I'll get up on stage after I've worked on a song, you know, with, with a rehearsal pianist and you get in front of an audience and then I'll be done and go, 
what was I thinking? That is just not for me. You know, but you never right. know. You never know. You can love something, but you got to really understand your own instrument and, you know, what it sounds best doing. So anyway, but do you think, a little do you think that, well, um, actually it's a really interesting way to start. Is, is that something, do you think, I, I love the idea that it's okay to fail because that means that you are pushing yourself, you know, and making room for more greatness and, and inspiration and, and continuing to raise the bar of what you do are, but is that part of how you find out? I mean, what do you feel bad about something when you get on stage and that happens or do you actually, you do? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I do. I do more, more often than I should. Close friends of mine will say, Cheryl, that was a great show. And I'll go, Oh God, that third verse on that third song right in the middle I completely messed up the blah 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 you know as an artist I only focus on what went wrong in a particular (laughs) performance it can be at one or two notes but then the whole evening is fine but oh no I can't embrace that I guess I guess as a as a uh you know, an artist, we, that's yeah. kind of what we do sometimes, you know, and we, I want perfection, but you know what, the older I get, the more I'm embracing my imperfection, which is beautiful. Yeah. That happened on this, on this recent solo record of Sondheim music. I, mm-hmm. I put it on a back burner for years. I was afraid of singing his music because I'm not a Broadway singer, you right. know, and somewhere between standards and jazz, I, I, I live somewhere in that you know, that, that, uh, that ether world or that, that abyss that, that isn't Broadway, that isn't jazz. I don't consider myself like a jazz singer because I don't really scat that much. And the improvisation is usually written out for me if I copy a right. horn line or whatever. Mm-hmm. But when I started approaching this project, I, I finally came full circle after quite a few years. And I thought, you know, you just got to sing the way your voice sounds right now. There's nothing more you can do, Cheryl. You know, I always heard, I once heard Pavarotti quoted as saying, tonight I go and sing with the voice that I have today. And I thought, oh my God, that's such a relief. Oh, nice. If Pavarotti yeah. can say that. You know, that's kind of, you know, just <laughs> letting yourself off the hook. It's like, this is, this is my voice today. So I had to approach that entire project that way, not really knowing but kind of getting much freer than I've ever been. You know, I, I reached right. a whole new plateau. I was going to say level. It isn't really going up. It's kind of right. just my plateau is kind of a, a relaxing uh, hammock, so to speak, where I yes. can just rest and go, well, that's how I sound now. And so enjoy. In, in, yeah, well, in that sense, I enjoyed it more. I produced mm-hmm. myself for the first time. and I, Yeah. Uh, I was much more accepting of my voice, which is kind of what we said a few minutes ago. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense, but it makes yeah. total sense. You know, I, I read yeah. a, a review um, by Thomas Cun- Cunliffe in Jazz History Online on your rearrangements of Shadows album. And one of the things that he said that speaks to this, he said she exhibits a great deal of freedom towards the music aided by flexible arrangements, but always remembers to tell the original stories. Wow. And it doesn't get better that than that. Thank you. No. Wow. N- yeah. And well, I, that cop- I chose arrangers. Yeah. I chose certain arrangers that I needed them to stretch me out beyond the, the you know, outside the lines. Right. So John Beasley, of course, just blew, mm-hmm. me, blew it out of the water. Just beautifully. As always. Bevan Manson mm-hmm. did two amazing string quartet arrangements. You know, I kind of gave them a, a foundation. I, I I, I gave him no direction except don't follow any rules with these songs, you know, thinking that's what I got to do here. And I'll be darned. That's exactly what they did. And it was beautifully challenging. Oh, my God. It was so, you know, exhilarating to sing with like Beasley's chart or Eli Brugerman right. did uh, did Sand. And these guys, they took me there. I just hopped on and they they were driving the boat. Well, I love that you said n- that you the the guidance are, and the parameters that you gave your rangers was no rules because that comes across on comedy tonight, you know, with that um, <laughs> that arrangement with just playing with the time signatures and it's and it's kind of oh 
uh, avant-garde yeah. strings, and it, it was really caught my ear. I tilted on it in a good way. Yeah, yeah. I tilted, and, you know, pretty much on my <laughs> head, tried to stick along. He had to conduct me because I said, oh, I'm dear, sure. Did I tell him to go too far out? You know, That's and right. I just met this gentleman. You know, I thought, well, just just take it out. You know, take it out to Stravinsky or, or Zappa or wherever you yeah. want to go. Ooh, I didn't even need to say that, I don't think, because yeah. he, he absolutely took me on a wild, wild ride. And I love I love doing it. Yeah. That's I commend you as a as a fellow producer because I produce myself as well as as well as producing other artists. Yeah. And and mm-hmm. it's really wonderful that you were able to and interested and curious to throw yourself off the ledge in a sense and and it created yeah. uh, an environment for that to happen where, again, you were pushed um, to a new yeah. level. Yeah. Oh, Boy, it, maybe not right. even a new level. I, I, yeah. Well, it's a, I mean, it's a level that I think, you know, I see you over the years singing with the transfer and, you know, I consider that you are always pushing each other collectively to a new level of, of vocal singing um, mm-hmm. that, you know, I'm. I mean, look, you're in in the premier vocal group. Um, you know, because uh, you know those. You're really the ones who are who are carrying the torch in in my mind. Uh, and mm-hmm. and you do that in a way collectively because you you don't settle for comfort. You're always you know pushing. I mean, and it's great. Yeah. It's great. And I love that you do that in your solo records as well. What prompted you to produce yourself instead of bringing in another producer? Um, money. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna. <laughs> I was gonna follow up by you saying know, budget. You know, honestly, you know, I did, I did. It through uh, through Artist Share, which is of course crowdfunding, and yes. the money. You know, it was nice. I had some great support under me, but I got to a point where I thought, you know, I asked a couple of people, different people, about mm-hmm. producing, and I mentioned it to uh, Artist Share and. And then I went, you know what, between me and my wonderful engineer, Tom McCauley, who I've yeah. worked with forever, he's the only engineer who knew, knows my voice so well, I thought, right. I bet he and I can do this. So I started, when I when I gave myself permission to be mm-hmm. in charge, it all was like, it was all like written out for me. I don't know if you believe in this, but there was a path there and and as soon as I got the brush out of the way and, mm-hmm. you know, and looked straight down there, I could see every song I wanted. I, I knew how I kind of wanted to approach it. Mm-hmm. And I had an idea of the arrangers. It went bang, 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 just like that. And yeah. I mean, it happened so quickly and so precisely and yet so effortlessly. I thought right. I didn't even have time to think about it. So Good. when I got in the studio and started singing, you know. There was a lot of freedom there because I, I was just singing for me and for the right. music. I wasn't having yes. to, you know, please a producer or, or you know. And, and honestly, the studio is not my comfort zone. I, it's very challenging for me, you know. Right. And but You prefer project, being on stage? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not, you know, I've had some rough experiences in the past when I first joined the transfer of how to fit sure. in and. And how to sound and what kind of songs are we going to give Cheryl, you know, because everyone kind of had their role in the group except me. So I tried a couple pop songs that did not work. and It was (laughs) devastating. I thought, I can't I can't be a recording artist, you know, but I was not that's not my style. So it's taken me, you know, a long time to finally, again, accept my voice and know what I do best. You know, so, um, yeah, the producing myself was such relief because I had mm-hmm. a good time. And I'm yes. like a two, I'm a two take uh, singer. If I get to you three are... takes, I'm over the hill, you know. Right. So I, I got one or two in me and then that's what do you lose, do, so. do you lose interest or focus or stamina or you just know that you need to just go for it and just get it? No, it's almost the opposite. I don't lose interest. I start thinking too much. So I'm, I'm too right. interested in how every note should sound. You know, right. the first so you're micromanaging you art. Yeah. yeah, yeah, micromanaging every note. So by the third <laughs> take, I'm thinking, 
okay, I, that second phrase, I want to do it like this. And then the third, mm-hmm. and you can tell, I can tell anyway, when I hear a singer, you know, if I hear a record, not so much live, because live is a whole different animal, you know, yeah. that is just in the moment, which is what I love. But in the studio, you know, I can hear great singers, some of which I'm very close to, that sound, you walk away going, what a great singer, but you're not moved, you know. And right. so I mm-hmm. find there's there's that fine line between doing that performance in the studio that has an edge that you can feel I'm on the edge of a cliff. Right. But on three takes or four takes or other singers that really want perfection, it you know, it doesn't move me. I'd rather hear an off note. I'd rather hear a breath or a crack in my voice, which there's yes, a lot sister, of that in, I agree. in my recording. I, I, you know, I agree. It's honest. Shirley Horn is my favorite singer, and she's, mm-hmm. oh, you know, it's yeah. like she rolls out of bed and sings a song and, and takes yeah. you takes you to, like, emotional places. That's my right. goal, is to just mm-hmm. remain in that moment. Well, there there's a perfection to me in in imperfect in the imperfection of of making records that way and it's the way that yeah that i love to record because for me i've always looked at it as capturing this moment in time you're just it's a, it's yeah. an oral snapshot of this really beautiful <laughs> honest intimate moment If you're doing it right and when you're doing it right, and that might mean a note's a little under or, you know, you rush a phrase, but, Mm -hmm. but that, that's where the beauty is. And I, and I'm sure you've learned this as well, because we, we self-criticize when I've done sessions on other people's records and we all play. And then I'm, Mm -hmm. you know, I'll, I'll call out something to the producer if I'm not producing and say, Hey, at bar 62, I rushed going into the bridge yeah, you might want to take mm-hmm. a listen and they'll listen to that and they'll go, that was amazing. I love that you rushed we into the it. bridge. <laughs> it felt good. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll yeah. say, well, you know, I can fix it and give you another option to go, are you crazy? Let's, you know, yeah, keep exactly. it. It's great. It's perfect. Because like you said, it's just, you're, you're just in the moment. And, and to me, there's, mm-hmm. that's what I consider perfection in recording is capturing mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. those beautiful moments. Yeah. And, and trust, trusting, trust, just yes. trusting what what it is, and that that's the perfect moment for that particular, uh, you know, song or even phrase. Yeah, yeah. And to you, does that come with age and experience, or or? Oh yeah. And is for it a, me, it sure does. <laughs> me too. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's funny though. There's that other side of it. I'll look back on a an early video of the transfer or something that's on on YouTube and I'll see me standing there just like blasting out these double, you know, high G's and just, just mm-hmm. singing <laughs> like crazy and not even not putting no effort into it whatsoever. When today I try to do those <laughs> same licks or those same vocalese songs and I really have to work at it. So yeah. I'm thinking, Oh my God, I didn't know how easy it was for me until I right. look back on it now, you know. Right, because our but, our voices and our ability our ability and facility on our instruments change as we get older. The absolutely, instrument changes. Absolutely. Yeah. Are yeah. you and are I you get still more critical of myself? Yeah. Yes. Well, isn't that fascinating because you get more critical and at the same time you become more accepting. You know, simultaneously. No. <laughs> oh, is that possible? But that's true. It's true. Yeah. Well, fortunately, it's true because otherwise, I think we would quit. You know, it would yeah. the, the 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 critical aspect that pushes us yeah. to continue just to continue to work on our craft and continue mm-hmm. bringing the bar up another level every time we do something, or or just or keeping the bar at the level of just showing up and and being present and right. and right. telling the story and and like you said, moving somebody with th- mm-hmm. the same way that mm-hmm. you're being moved by this piece of music that um that makes you want to record it i think it's it's yeah. um i don't know it's such a cool part of the creative process for for me i really it I'm really is in love it, with it, it and fascinated so by it i know yeah. i know i i am too we're so lucky we get to do this you know and i think yes. other art forms hopefully it has the same kind of foundation where you know it's got to be there's got to be spontaneity in it you know there's got to be that you know flying high without a net kind of right. feeling otherwise right. it's it's just it's just too it's too planned 
it's too purposeful. It's too, you know, I know this will be a hit if we do it. I mean, uh, a former right. record company did this to us once where we did Boy from New York City, which was a mm-hmm. great idea, obviously. We And uh, we recorded it. And even our producer said, this is going to be a hit. You know, and we were all excited. And sure enough, it hit. It hit really hard. And then our record label said, I think we should find another one and do another, you know, another boy from New York City type of thing. And we tried. We came up with a couple different tunes and all four of us went, you know, no, (laughs) that's not the reason to do this is to, you know, to copy a spontaneous idea like boy from New York City and try and do another one. It doesn't work. You know, you can put your best foot forward, but something in the universe is going, nope, nope, <laughs> you thought this through too far. You know, it's real interesting. There was some spontaneity or some, you know, some that just didn't didn't happen with the second or third try that we attempted. You know, it just. Yeah, you're trying you too hard. That. No, you're trying no, you too can't. hard yeah. for the wrong so, reasons, too. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, because it's art versus commerce, I guess, or or yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, record mm-hmm. labels stepping in, and 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 the their bottom line is different than ours, and they're both important. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, it yeah. it is a business we're in, and we still part of the business, and and the challenge of the business is to mm-hmm. continue to keep art, um. And into um, or music into <laughs> the phrase music business, mm-hmm, so it, mm-hmm. it doesn't exactly. just become all business. Um, yeah. How are you? How are you dealing with your voice changing with age? Are you Are you taking vocal lessons still? Do you vocalize every day? Do you only warm up when you're on the road or getting ready to do a session? Um, What's your routine? Hmm. Well, my voice has changed for a number of reasons. You know, I'm in my sixties. And I uh, went through a, a health uh, few years there, a health uh, you issue. You sure did. About, yeah. Yeah, 2011 to 2014, I had uh, cancer and I got it on the road. Well, I didn't get it on the road. It, I'm sure it was living inside for quite a while. But we were on the road in Europe and I got really sick and it, I couldn't I couldn't shake it. And we we're on a tough tour. And I couldn't breathe well. I had no appetite. I was losing weight. And I thought, oh, I got the flu. You know, <laughs> just, right. sure. just a, a heads up to anyone out there. Note to self, if you think you're that sick and got the flu, go to the doctor. You know, so um, we finished the tour. And a day later, my partner, Alan Paul, gave me the name of his doctor. And he said, you got to go in today. Something's wrong here. So mm-hmm. um I went the next day and I was in the hospital and I had all kinds of tests and I was off the road for eight months, you know, with um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and then had a year of, re- of uh, a restful year with, with no reoccurrence. And then a year later, it came back. So uh, Yes. Yeah, you had it twice. It because I, I've heard, yeah, I had it twice. I've heard of a lot of people that go through different types of cancer and it does affect your entire body. You know, you're doing all that chemo. It's, it's burning the hell out of your insides, you know? Yes. Don't want to take a hot bath for a year because your insides are are burning out. (laughs) On fire. You know, this is the stuff that you you don't hear about out there. Right. But it did change my voice. I I was coming full circle to say it, um, it weakened it in certain areas. And of course I wasn't singing for a long time. And, um, before I went back out on the road, I sat home and just sang to our records, you know, for like a couple of weeks. I thought, let's mm-hmm. see what's going on here. Right. And to this day, I mean, I could still go up pretty high cause that's my job. That's the notes mm-hmm. I'm supposed to hit. That's why I'm in this group, but there's, it's one of the reasons why you're in this group. It's not the only reason. Oh. <laughs> I'm just saying from the outside. I don't know what's going on on the inside, but from listening to the records. Well, but there's some mid-range stuff that has really gotten awkward. It's very strange. So I don't, you know, there's a few notes in the mid top that are, that I just can't seem to maneuver very well. And as much as I warm up, as much as I do exercises, there's still something there. So I guess what I need to say is, you know, give yourself a break. 
you know, you, you're still singing yes. and you're out there doing this. And my hair grew back twice, you know, right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, I, and I feel fantastic. So whatever yes. oh, good. I'm glad. my voice is, is just fine with me. You know, well, I'm the, just singing the other thing, it. you know, the other thing, Cheryl is, uh, you know, However, it's affected your voice. There's another part of the experience that has brought more to you as a as an artist and a musician. You know, so I think there's, mm -hmm. you know, you give up something and you gain something in another area that that creates mm -hmm. more depth to what you yeah. bring to every song and every day, um, whatever it is that you're yeah. doing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, just as a as a human being, as a person, right? You know, I've, exactly. I'm really, uh, I, it resonates when I look on Facebook and I see someone that's just, you know, getting chemo or someone, I don't even know them. And I'll write them a little note and go, you know, hang in there. You know, hmm. chemo is not the scariest thing you could, you could do right now. You know, I always thought it was the most terrifying thing, but it's not, it saves your life. You know, it's pretty right. rough on the body, but, but um, yeah, I'm different. I, I, I was attending these, these meetings at a place called We Spark in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. run by Nancy Allen, actress, mm -hmm. and she yes. started this entire organization that's um, wonderful. Meetings, you know, uh, uh, all kinds of benefits to raise money for it. And I'd, I'd go to those meetings and sit in those rooms with these ladies, and one of them said something that just like you know threw me back against the wall. She goes, "I'm different now. I will never be." who I was. And I took that home. I mean, I was like sitting in a chair going, wow, I'm different yeah. now. It was almost relief. You know, it was almost like, oh, I don't have to be the, the vivacious, crazy, wacky, full of energy kind of Cheryl that I was for the last, right. you know, 59 years or whatever. Exactly. And exactly. Uh, yeah. So um, you're, you're the new and improved Cheryl Benteen. I'm new and improved and I have all new cells. So that's kind of nice. I had a and you're here, and you know, so I'm <laughs> yeah. I'm so happy to hear that that you're feeling well and and that we're, yeah, you know, you're alive. My you're alive. You're true. you're making music. You're <laughs> restoring houses. You're you are still get to be you still get <laughs> to be a mom to your daughter and and that's right. You know that's right. that's, that's yeah. Um, she helped me through it too, man. She just kind of held my hand and would mm -hmm. sit in the hospital with me and, and dance and we'd play music. And yeah, it was pretty, pretty rough on her. You know, it's harder on the people around you. I think I know it sounds oh, that's weird, interesting. It, no, it's that makes emotionally sense. harder because people around, they just would kind of stare at me like, what can I do? And I'm going, well, nothing. Just I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, right. you just take right. direction, you know, and I'm pretty good at that. So. So, so um, you just sang at Fenway Park. How cool is that? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I've lived in Boston on and off for 20, no, no, no. What am I saying? About 10, 11 years and never stepped foot in Fenway, in Fenway Park, <laughs> you know, which is the most famous baseball park in in the universe, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm involved in an on, in a group of people, an organization called Voices of Hope, and they are a miraculous bunch of wonderful people that sing all ages, you know, from mm -hmm. high school to my age. And um, I'm trying to uh, do a benefit concert, and they work, you know, to help cancer research. Duh. So there we are. <laughs> we're we're kind of you know. We met, we were supposed to meet. So I was having lunch with them a week or so ago. And I said, so what's going on? They said, well, we're, we're singing at Fenway tonight. Well, actually it was last week. And I said, what? And they said, yeah, we're doing the uh, national anthem. And I just, they could tell I was rattled. And I said, I've never been to Fenway. They said, well, you better come and sing with us. <laughs> the next day I bundled up. It was 35 degrees. It was, it was pretty mm -hmm. chilly. Yeah. And there we did. We went on the field and sang the national anthem. And it was one of those thrilling moments. You yeah. Know, I was. What a kick. Yeah, hey, let's, kind of, let's talk about your, your first year in LA when you moved down from, um, well, you had, you had finished high school. You moved to Seattle, um, ended mm -hmm. up, 
auditioning and working with the New Deal Rhythm Band. And were you were on the road for four years, which I, I'm sure that you learned a lot. Um, what yeah. what do you think the most important lesson is from those four years before we talk about the the move to L.A.? Wow. What'd you get out of being wow. on the road for four years? <laughs> well, I call those my college years because I didn't right. go to college. I left mm-hmm. high school like a half year early because I had all my credits. I not the most <laughs> academic human, you know. And by the way, <laughs> let me academic. interject. You didn't go to college, but you got an honorary doctorate from Berkeley. Uh, I know. which is pretty I wonderful. Backwards. What can I do? Right. I went to college and I I have a, a, a you know, bachelor's degree from Berkeley. I didn't I didn't get a doctorate. So wow. so it's, so you it's got the real deal. Yeah. Well, you know, we both got the real deal. Uh, <laughs> the cosmetic doctorate, you know, it's just so, a little thing on my shelf. But so uh, let's talk it, about your college yeah, years on the years. road. Yeah, my college years. A bunch of crazy guys, and uh, we sang. You know, we did swing music, early swing, and just <laughs> pretty much did the Northwest. You know, came down as far as San Francisco, and uh, right. and just you know, I just worked my little tush off. I worked real hard. I made two hundred and fifty dollars a week which you mm-hmm. know, I thought was pretty great. Yeah. And um, I learned everything. I learned everything from that, not only just to uh, to show up, but to do four, you know, four sets a night in these clubs, right. you know, in, you know, the way we used to do it. We'd start at eight or eight 30 and be done at one in the morning and right. that five nights in a row. And, mm-hmm. You know, it was just, you know, you learn to do that. You learn to just, buck up and, and show up and suit up and sing. Mm-hmm. You know? right. And I worked hard. I did all these different characters. I did Carmen Miranda. I did <laughs> Ruby Keeler. I did a tap dance. I did a thing from a big spender where I came out like a hooker. And, oh God, <laughs> it was fun. It was theater, you know, but right. it, was, it yes. was great fun. Yeah. You know, so, so, so when you moved to LA, um, I, I know a lot of things happen as they do for all of us. And, and, but I know that you were also waitressing and then you met a manager, you hooked up with Linda Friedman and Linda mm-hmm. uh, got you taking dance and singing lessons as well, you know, and you were also playing at the Troubadour and the blah, blah, and just really getting out yeah. there. But li- how yeah. did you find your first manager? How did you run into her and, well, you know, she, make that happen? Um, she, well, it was pretty amazing. She saw, did she see the? She knew the transfer. She was from a company, uh, Friedman and Johnston. They were promoters out of San Francisco, and they had promoted a couple of Manhattan Transfer shows. So, um, you know, before the audition for the transfer that she was definitely a part of, um, we came down to L.A. and I needed a manager and I wanted to do something. And she put me, like you said, in dance lessons, singing lessons. You know, I played, you know, Hoot Night at the Troubadour and I did Waitress. Mm -hmm. And I did this for like almost two years. And I finally said, you know, agents, she'd have agents come and they liked me, but I wasn't doing anything original. I was doing kind of cabaret. And at one Mm -hmm. point I said, you know, I'm done here. I think I got to go to New York. This is not my town. This is for rock and roll. This is not for cabaret. This is, you know, I'm more theatrical, blah, blah, blah. And Mm -hmm. I swear to you within 24 hours, she said, she called me. She said, I got a call um, to, for you to audition for the Manhattan transfer if you're interested. And I said, what? Yeah. You know, I, I just said, of course, I'd love to. <laughs> and this was literally, I had made the decision. I was ready right. to move. Right. And somehow, you know, the old open a window, close a door, open another window right. kind of thing sure. happened. Amazing. This is yeah. exactly what happened. So I, uh, I prepared a couple of songs. Uh, I knew the group, of course. I was mm-hmm. a fan of the group. And uh, went to Janice's house. She lived on Camrose, right around the corner from Hollywood Bowl. And right. we sat around her piano, and I sang Candy with them. And uh, You Can Depend on Me. And I had four brothers in my back pocket. I was ready to sing that, too. But they right. didn't ask yeah. for that. I mean, because I, I sang the melody, so it was pretty easy for me to uh, to walk in and sing. But it wasn't. It was terrifying. I was just of course. out of my mind. Oh, yeah. And was it so ever on your said, radar? Was that something no. like back when, okay, no. it's just. No, okay. I, I love them. 
but I never, yeah. I had never sung with other voices, you know, I just, but I knew that music, obviously. That's what I grew up on. So, and I love them a special, so much. There's a special skill, Cheryl, that in that not every singer has. And I know a lot of mm-hmm. amazing singers. Most of them are really good at one of two things. I mean, they're good at other things, but I mean, their specialty is either singing melodies or they're really good at blending and, you know, like really finding mm. their place in the chord and within the group, but they're not mm-hmm. maybe the best solo singers, uh, you know, when it comes to really interpreting a song, there are right. people like, like you and everybody else in, in that group that can do both. And uh, where did you, you know, it's, I'm surprised, I guess, is where I'm going with this, that you well, weren't used yeah. to singing in a group and then you, you, f- did you feel comfortable? Did you find your, your blend with them that yeah. afternoon when you were at the house? Yeah. Yeah. Instantly. It, it was like instantly. instantaneous, but it's right. funny because they even said that they said, we need someone who can blend and can also be a strong soloist. Sure. And I thought, well, I got the solo thing down. I think <laughs> that's all I've known, but right. I also knew this music. I knew how to swing. Yeah. You know, you've right. got to be able to swing when you're singing. The Absolutely. Band. You know, yeah. it's not all pop music. In fact, very little of it is. It's it's mm-hmm. mostly, you know, uh, even the rhythm and blues and the swing, the big band and the, uh, the vocalese. And so when I sat down and, and started singing Candy, you know, obviously a big, big band swing tune. And uh, right. I, I, I don't know. It just was meant to be. I don't have a really it, clever yeah. answer for that, except that I... I knew their voices and maybe because I grew up with my father was a clarinet player and I grew up singing with his band and heard how those horns, they just, you know, they blended together because that's what you're supposed to do when there's more than one voice or more than one horn. You got to be conscious of the others, you know, and make it come out like one sound. Mm -hmm. So we did, we did. We, you know, we, we all opened our mouths and started singing candy um, it just, it, it was just like, you know, it was like butter. <laughs> <laughs> it, really, it really was. And they even said, they told me later, they said after about eight bars of the song, they looked at each other and they knew, yeah. they knew right. it was the blend they were looking for. I didn't know. I just knew it was pretty wonderful to be able to sing with these guys. You know, so, the, um, the, the coolest part of this story for me is, is, and I think it's part of the reason that it went so well at that audition, besides your training and, you know, singing with your dad growing up and all the things that you did in your four years on the road, there was the part of the story is the resolve of like, you know, something, this isn't for me. I need to get out of the city and go move to New York and try something else. Right? I'm out of here. So you, you had already, there was this, um, detachment or, not the angst yeah. of continuing to try to make it in this city yeah. because you were already looking yeah. towards finding another way to do it. So, and maybe in a way yeah. you went in there more relaxed and just, and were maybe able to fully appreciate the experience. Interesting. Interesting. I, I mean, I always knew there was something magical about, you know, just completely throwing caution to the wind and going, I'm done <laughs> here. I'm done here. I had sold my piano already. And wow, I was good. ready. Yeah. I was ready to go. You know, and you know when when a door closes, a window, a major window. You know, it was like French doors open. It wasn't even a window. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> with a big but sure, you want to do right. this? Here, try this. <sighs> so it was. It was pretty amazing. It is. You and know, I believe in that stuff. I totally do. I I do too. No, I, I absolutely yeah. do. One hundred percent. I know you do. Well, yeah. When you were taking dance lessons, um, what were you taking modern or ballet and where did you do it? And did you enjoy it or and how did that help what you with your performance? The, it was, was it rolling, edged? What was it? I, I took, I took movement and dance, not, not okay. tap, not ballet, but just jazz yeah. dance, you know, Roland. Oh, what was the name of the dance? It was on Beverly. And it was a, a dance studio, pretty famous. Right. One. Okay. And I loved yeah. it. It was a lot of you fun. You did? Um, were, were you really physical before that? Did you grow up exercising or was being in, in dance class really your first time of uh, being 
No, I'm disciplined. I, had, I have a sense of, of movement, you know, and in New Deal, I did a lot of movement. I was the, right. I was the mover sure. shaker on stage. The guys are absolutely and I'm dancing you're, around. You're, you're but, the point of focus on, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I've always loved to dance and movement. It's, it, you know, you're, the whole body is your instrument when you're a singer too. I mean, you've yeah. got to be connected from the toes up. And I really believe it's it's good to have a sense of every, you know, every portion of your body when you're singing, you know, when you're performing. You don't necessarily have to move all the time, but just to be aware of every every limb and every toe and every shoulder move is real important, I think. Yeah. You know, to just stand there. I mean, I've coached singers, you know, young singers, and I'm, you know, the kind of stand leaning on one leg and I go please don't do that. I said, you're completely <laughs> ignoring the instrument, which is you, you know, and I'll right, spend a right. whole day, you know, in workshops just on body. You know, we won't even open our mouths. I'll just go, mm-hmm. okay, you know, you gotta, you've got to use everything that's here. You know, the advantage is your whole body is the instrument, but that's also the disadvantage because if something goes wrong, if you're sick, you know, right. You are, you know, it it hinders your performance. So right. you can't blame it on a bad read or a string breaking. You know, right. you gotta you gotta show up for the for the voice. Right. So yeah, movement is real important, I think. Let's talk about for a moment, talk about the importance of breathing, because I know you speak about that a lot. And um tell me. Yeah. I, um, well, I'm <laughs> I did a C D a few years ago called Bliss. Right. I know, and, and it suddenly it's popped up again on Facebook. So I'm going to reiterate that it's it's a really interesting approach to uh, not so much breathing because it's more the chakra tones, but it right. does involve a lot of breath and and how to not circular breathe, but to wake up obviously all the chakras, and then by the time you're up at the the head, it's like. You could like, you know, <laughs> blast yourself to the moon and back. But with breathing, <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm working on, on a breathing uh, exercise. I do a lot of breathing exercises with students. You know, before you even open your mouth to, to sing a note, there's got to be a sense of effortless breathing. You know, effortless is the key word here, I think. You know, mm-hmm. it's got to be second nature. It's got – and you'd be surprised – how often we forget to breathe when we're standing there singing or in just everyday life, you know, that's the fuel for heaven's sake. So, right. you know, I'm, I'm trying to do a lot of that. I'm trying to, I, when I'm off the road, I, I make a job and say, yeah, I'm just going to go home and breathe for a while. Cause <laughs> <laughs> I just that's, need to breathe. You know, Cheryl, that's fantastic. I mean, I it's that you um, are aware of that and that you actually gift yourself with that and, and you know, value the, the importance of something that seems like it might be so obvious and simple, but it, it's not necessarily I mean, I that do obvious. Don't, I, None I'm of us not do. That great of an example, you know. I forget. <laughs> don't forget to breathe. I wrote an article right. once for... This is a hundred years ago, and I've forgotten I did this for downbeat, I think. And that's what I called it. And it was all based on, my God, you have to breathe. You have to breathe, or life just stops, you know, <laughs> literally. Right, yeah. absolutely. Well, yeah. 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 Hey, I want to ask you an arranging question, and I typically don't do this, but mm. but uh, when you, you won a Grammy uh, for your uh, arrangement, that you did with another night in Tunisia with Bobby McFerrin and, and, mm-hmm. and you, there was a, a rhythmic playfulness that you explored in the arrangement by shifting time signatures, you between three, four and four, mm-hmm. four. And, and again, I normally don't get that technical, but you know, it really felt playful. And I was wondering your creatively, how did you come up with that? Um, that idea were you just kind of walking around singing it or were you, was it an intellectual thing or just sort of this visceral, I have this idea and you kind of followed that, that mm, treasure hunt well, on the, how to do that. <laughs> Interesting treasure hunt. That it definitely yes. was. It was an adventure in uh talk about having no, uh, no net under us. My group, right. you know, we're based on really, you know, on charts, on arrangements written out, Yes, you know, absolutely. following the note, sitting at the piano, doing, doing two parts at a time, doing three parts, doing all four parts, 
you know, we took a long time to learn Birdland, sitting at Janice's piano. And I can imagine. And all those notes and getting all those parts. Well, when we did vocalese, and I, it was, I really, my idea was to work with this wonderful new singer by the name of Bobby McFerrin. This is way <laughs> before, don't worry, you're happy. Don't worry, be happy. Mm-hmm. It was way before that, but he was wow. just an amazing, you know, he did something different as a vocalist. It was he was yeah. you know charting new new uh, new territory there completely. Right. So everybody said yes, what a great idea. And I mm-hmm. thought I don't really think I want to do uh, lyrics so much, but let's I want to do like a vocalese just vocal thing exercise with Bobby. So I flew up to San Francisco where they lived at the time. And sat in his music room with him, and we just started. He just started hitting his chest. And I thought, "What the right. hell? What is he doing? <laughs> <You know? laughs> this is all right." Crazy. And started to just turn on a little cassette machine, and we just experimented with, right? You know, riffs, which is what he does so well. You know, I just mm-hmm. sat there for a while. You know, he he developed the riffs, and then he'd have me sing a riff, and then he'd do another one. Well, this is historically how he started to do what he now does. You know, twenty four seven. You know, he'll get right. a whole audience of three, four thousand people to do it. Well, I was in the room. I was one of those first ones. It was thrilling, and we just sat there and had a yeah. ball. And it was scary because we were in a, we were in territory we did not know at all. The transfer. So right. the things that were written, I wrote the little uh, like Baroque thing, the Dizzy Gillespie bridge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I wrote that out because I wanted that mm-hmm. to be like a little classical moment. And right. then we wanted John Hendricks to come in and sing only the Charlie Parker break, only the break. Well, he put right. lyrics to it. And of course. <laughs> uh, it was unbelievable. <laughs> so it, it turned yeah. into something bigger than I thought it would be, you know, and he mm-hmm. did that. And, and when we went in the studio, there was no chart. You know, Bobby just said, okay, you guys do this line. You guys do this line over and over and over. And okay, you do that line. You do this. And just pointed to us. And we just, we just trusted him again. That was, mm-hmm. you know, something that I would love us to do something like that again, you know? Yeah. So that was, that was pretty amazing adventure, you know, something we had never, never attempted. Well, you, um... and it turned out pretty good. <laughs> you, you think? <laughs> John, John got a grant for his little, like, how many bars is that solo? It's probably. I don't remember. That's you know? it. <laughs> I don't know. Not very long. You know, and no. he won a Grammy for that. And Bobby and I won for the arranging. It was just yeah. crazy. Because it was so, like we were saying earlier, it's so like jumping off a cliff. Right. You know? It was so exciting to do. So exciting. I would imagine that that gave you the the courage or at least like a reference point um, in, for the rest of your, you know, from that point to now and continuing for the rest of your career in life as an artist and singer to just be willing and able to throw yourself off a cliff um, artistically because you know, you know what's on the other side of the cliff Possibly. <laughs> if you're there, it's not always Possibly. that, but <laughs> <laughs> not always. Not always. Yeah, but but it's it allows you to terrify. Yeah. Oh it, yeah. It of course it is. But that but that's where the it magic is. lies. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah, exactly. When, I mean when our new that. record, the, the the junction, which you know yeah. I, I'd love to talk about as well. I think that happened a lot on this on this project with the transfer too, because we had we had a fearless leader in Mervyn Warren. You know, Mm -hmm. uh, which I think we've all wanted to work with for years. And it just turned out perfectly time-wise and artistically. And he wrote everything. He wrote all the charts, all the vocal arrangements. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, you know, he really challenged us. It It was not easy stuff to do. And yet, because he said he grew up with us. He knew right. all of our songs. We'd be sitting in the studio, and he'd start singing like a, a, a solo from uh, Joy Spring or Killer Joe. He knew everything, mm-hmm. you know. And this mm-hmm. is Merv Warren, who has had great Take Six and since Take Six. I mean, he's mm-hmm. he's a film, you know, he's a film guy now. Yeah. So yeah. this was also, I mean, we put all of our trust in him, and he would 
he would look at me and go, okay, do this, do this slit, go up, blah, 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 blah. no charts, you know, and right. I go, oh. <laughs> okay. you know, okay. that's really hard, you know, for someone who I read music, you know, I can play yeah. piano and it's to let go of all that and trying to hear it. You know, he did write a lot of charts, but he also did, you know, really challenge us just to sing something that he heard. And then he's got this perfect ear. So, oof. It's hard. It's hard. It was hard to please him, but when you did, right. oh my God, the payoff was like unbelievable. You know, and I'd walk out of the studio on air, just like, ah, I did it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we we are. Um, I'll make sure that um, the producer of the show puts links up to both uh, the new transfer album and also your latest album as well, so people can find them both. Where. We oh, actually only have about you. seven minutes left in the conversation, and I've got a couple of wow. Um, I know closing questions <laughs> that, yeah, faster than usual <laughs> for me. Um, oh, and I so, love it. yeah, me too. So we um, here's what I ask all of my guests at at the end of each show. Uh, uh, there's two basic sections to this. One is a, a two part question. What is making it? mean to you both personally and professionally? And also, can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Oh, my. No time I had to think about this. Oh, my goodness. Right. What is making it? Well, when I was younger, it probably had a different definition. I mean, I think young artists always put put like a, a deadline on their success. That is mm-hmm. not making it. You know, and that is not um, being open to the possibility. I think number one is is being flexible to to if if another door opens that you didn't expect, go through that door. Don't yeah. trust your own plan. You know, you got to like you, you got to be open to maybe there's going to be another plan here. There was for me. I didn't plan on being in the vocal group, and look yeah. what happened. So I think being open and and not having such a a strict plan for yourself, you know, and mm-hmm. the other thing is probably just, just to trust, to trust who you are in the moment and, and to trust all the changes your life goes through and to really, really somehow, you know, because we're artists, we're our worst critics, but you've got to embrace your own specific talent, your own art and not compare yourself to anyone else. Mm-hmm. You know, well said. So my 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 final question, Cheryl, is, and we've got about five minutes left. Uh, at this point of your life, with everything that you know to be true, and with everything that you've experienced, uh, what would you tell your younger self? <laughs> wow, that's that's emotional, you know. Because yeah, when you go back and look back at little Cheryl, who I used to, I learned to sing looking in the mirror, singing to Barbara Streisand. <laughs> That's how I learned to do what I know how to do. And I hid it so well from my family. They didn't know I could do it. They didn't know I was a singer. So I think, oof, what would I tell my younger self? That you're going to be okay. You're going you're gonna to be fine no matter what happens in your life. You're going to be okay and you're not alone. Because I felt alone all my life. You're not alone if you're in music. You got music. You're not, you're never alone. That's beautiful. And I'm um, also, um, I'm wondering. I don't know. That's just what came out. I don't know. No, good. Well, look, there's no right or wrong answer. I just want to know how you, no. yeah. Yeah. You know, and like you said, little Cheryl, because that's, that's what we're speaking about. And, and it's fascinating mm-hmm. to hear all of the amazing artists who have been on, on my show, what they have to say about that. But, you know, you mm-hmm. grew up. You know, your your family loved music. There was music in your house. And you. Mm-hmm. W- why did you feel like you needed to hide it? the fact that you were a, this know. wonderful little singer? I don't know. I mean, I, I just was, I didn't, it was just my little secret. I was, you know, an yeah. only child, basically. I had oh, you are, okay. yeah, yeah. who were all grown, but yeah. so it was just me in the house by myself. I was, I was uh-huh. just, I was a little isolator. You know, and yeah. my mother saw me do a review in high school. I did uh, Funny Girl, you know, when I was a freshman in high school. And she came to the mm-hmm. performance, and that's when she saw that I could sing. And she goes, I didn't know you could sing. Now you got to go <laughs> sing with your dad. And that's how it started. 
Wow. So I said, okay. I guess okay. I thought everyone could sing. <laughs> <laughs> well, th- that is not true. <laughs> if, well, I mean, look if I if I could sing like you, I never would have gone and learned how to become an arranger and producer and composer and guitar player and all that stuff. I would have. But look, um, I I can't survive without you guys. I cannot survive without you. So absolutely. we're a team. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's <laughs> this is, you know, it's so interesting in what we do, because there's so much isolation, uh, you know, alone time with the discipline of practicing piano like you grew up playing and, and singing. Mm-hmm. And but but it's also it there, it's such a communal um, it's not an effort, but it's a communal experience and including our audience. And, and when I say that, it's not even the live audience, but it's the people that we are leaving room for when we make our records for for them to insert themselves in the listening experience. Yeah, you know, they're, yeah. it's not without them listening. Our, I feel like our, our my creation of, of music is not complete. Right. I agree. Yeah. I agree. So I don't think it's about very it. Communal. You know, when you start doing music, I you just do it for yourself because you got to right. do it. You got to express it, and hopefully, other people may enjoy it. Hopefully, you know. Yes, but that's not the so, criteria for me. It wasn't to begin with, you right. know. And then it becomes a business. Then it becomes a livelihood, and then you got to pay your mortgage. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> On your two hundred year old house. Art. Don't lose the art. Yeah. Don't lose the art. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what do you want to say in the last minute of our show? We've got a minute and a half. It's uh, it's all yours, Cheryl. I have nothing left, Terry. Yeah, <laughs> you've got. Um, do you want to tell everybody about your blog then? Uh, because uh, you're antiquing um, love. Oh, okay. Well, I'm rebuilding my website, CherylBenteen.net. And in it is going to be, you're going to be able to buy my CDs that I've recorded and own. I've got about six or seven of them from Japan. Yeah, there's many. From King Records. Yeah. And I also I also have uh, Junk for Joy where I go out and, <laughs> you know, one person's junk is another person's treasure. And that's my <laughs> motto. I have things that I build from junk. I have an antique house. So I have a lot of American pottery that I collect. I have sticks and rocks and I'm painting my kitchen. And, you know, this is this is my uh, this is another of my passions. I love to go antiquing, you know, and find something weird and odd that has meaning to me. You know, everything in my house, I can remember where I got it, you know, and that's that's pretty that's pretty incredible. You know, I believe mm-hmm. in visual art. I like to surround myself with I'm looking at art right now all over my house here. So it's it keeps me alive. On that note, I, I want to say thank you, Cheryl, for spending the hour with me. I want to thank all the listeners for spending the hour with us. Uh, everybody, go out and get these two albums. I'm going to give you three albums, actually. Manhattan Transfer's new album, The Junction. Uh, Cheryl mm-hmm. Benteen's solo album, Rearrangements of Shadows. And if you're feeling like you want to be more inspired, go go get my Silver Collection record. And my 25-year yeah. best of. And yeah, let's do it. Just go hear some new music. Thank you, Cheryl. I really appreciate you. We'll thanks, see everybody Mary. next week. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks a million. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. 
This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com.